Welcome to the program Reflecting on Jesus. This is the last in a series of seven devotions that are titled The Seven Portraits of Jesus. We have been trying to look at the way Jesus is presented or portrayed in the letters that were written to the seven churches that were in Asia Minor, a modern day Turkey. These letters were written a long time ago, that is toward the end of the first century AD written by John, having received a message or communication from Jesus. And the last of these seven uh, messages is the letter that was written or addressed to the church that was in Laodicea. Now, Laodicea was a very important uh, city, proud and prosperous. And this is the message that Jesus addressed to them. Revelation chapter 3 from verse number 14 uh, through 22. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one of the or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes, so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest. And repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person, and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious, and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. As I said earlier on, the city of Laodicea was a proud and prosperous city. To sort of demonstrate their prosperity or the level of their pride, historians tell us of an incident that happened sometime in AD 60. There was a devastating earthquake that destroyed many cities in that region. Uh, in that year, in AD 60, that is about 30 years before this letter was written to them. And because of the devastation that was brought by that earthquake, the central government of the Roman Empire decided that they were going to help the cities, affected cities, to rebuild. So they gave some financial resources. They made available financial resources for that purpose. Many cities gladly received this financial help but not so with Laodicea. Interestingly, they just said, no, thank you. We have enough resources. We'll take care of our situation on our own. And they did. Some historians tell us that the Laodiceans were not only able to rebuild and complete their city, but actually they finished before some cities that were being assisted by the central government. This is how rich and independent they were. They were self-reliant. They didn't need to rely on anyone else. And so we have a city that makes a statement through this gesture, a statement to the effect that as a city, we can do without the emperor. We can do without the assistance of the central government. Unfortunately, we also have a church in that city which had absorbed this uh, spirit of independence or, and self-reliance. And the believers in the church in Laodicea had this attitude also. And they were beginning to think that perhaps they could also do without Jesus. And Jesus addresses himself to such a proud and self-reliant audience and people. Many times, this is quite common and characteristic with us as human beings that as individuals, as families, as communities, as nations, when we begin to prosper, it becomes so easy to forget who God is. And sometimes I feel like 
we, as a world, we are in that place now. We're like, like Laodicea. Many have become so rich and they, they, don't, they don't feel they need any intervention from anyone to help them with anything. They believe they are there, they have arrived. Whatever they want, whatever they need, they know where to get it. And so, many do, uh, do not see the need to pray as whole communities, sometimes as huge populations within nations. But all this boils down to the individual. When individuals prosper, sometimes they begin to forget who God is and what Jesus plays in their lives and his irrelevance in their lives. He increasingly becomes irrelevant. So they think, or so it seems, as seems to have been the case with the believers in Laodicea. When we are successful in our careers, when we are getting those promotions, sometimes, interestingly, we pray for these things, for these breakthroughs, for God to bless us, for God to... And when God has blessed us, just like he did with ancient Israel, after God blessed them, they forgot the Lord, they forsook him. That is the testimony we get from the book of Judges. They forsook the Lord and they served other gods whom their fathers had never heard about. And this may also be the situation with the world and with us as individuals. When economies are booming and farmers are having double bumper harvests, like that fool that Jesus talks about in the Gospels after he had had a big uh, harvest. And he says, what else can I do except just to pull down these barns so that I build bigger and better ones and uh, make sure that I have food enough stored for years to come. But that night in the parable, the story says, he died. He died. My dear brothers and sisters, when I look at this letter, this is perhaps the most difficult or the strongest of the messages that were given, important as they all were. But there is not a single positive thing that Jesus says about the church in Laodicea. All that he says about them is negative. There was nothing to commend them for. And yet, they didn't realize their plight or their situation. It is quite dangerous for a person to be sick and not know that they are sick. If the first warning that you get that you are sick is dropping dead, then the first warning is the very last. But God would not allow them to perish. So he sends them a message as he sends it to us as well. And so, in spite of all their prosperity and riches, this city had one problem. They didn't have a source of clean water. They didn't have a source of water. And so they would get their water from a rival city, which was not too far from where they were situated. This city was called Hierapolis. And the city of Hierapolis was very popular back then, even to this day, for its uh, hot springs. Water would gargle out of the earth hot. And many people would go to bath in those hot waters because many believed that it would cure them from their sicknesses. And this water was channeled to Laodicea so that that city could have water. So it would come from Hierapolis hot. But by the time it got to Laodicea, it was no longer hot, but it was not cold either. So it was just lukewarm. And Jesus uses this to illustrate the spiritual condition of the believers who were in Laodicea. They were neither hot nor cold. Mark Finley, in one of his books, he says that the unfortunate thing with them is that they could not be inspired as saints and neither could they be asked to repent as sinners. Give me hot, give me cold. I can work with that. But lukewarm, Jesus says, no, I can't. No, I can't. You have to be hot or cold. Then I know what to do with you, Laodicea. And so he says to them in verse 20, which is where we want to end. He says, behold, I'm actually standing at your door and I'm knocking, desperately trying to get in which means he was locked outside. And talking about being locked outside, my mind goes to that unfortunate tragedy on the 24th of March, 2015, when the whole world woke up to the news that an airliner had tumbled out of the sky and crashed into the Alps in southern France while fly flying from Spain to Germany. 
So many questions were asked, and the world could, not, could scarcely believe when the evidence came out from the cockpit voice recorder. And in that voice recorder, it shows that in the last moments of that uh, jet, uh, uh, of that uh, ill-fated flight, the captain of that aeroplane was locked outside of the cockpit by the co-pilot. And the co-pilot was determined to destroy that aircraft. All the while, the captain was desperately knocking and trying to gain entry back into the cockpit so that he could uh, control the aircraft again, save it and save the lives of those on board. Unfortunately and sadly, and traumatizingly so, that captain never gained that access until impact. And everyone on board died. 150 people perished in that accident. How sad a situation it is. Whenever Jesus is not in control of our lives, as was the situation here in Laodicea, someone else is in control. Someone else is in control. And, Jesus, and that can only be the devil. And his determination is to destroy your life. Jesus is saying, let me gain access of your life. Regardless of how rich you are, how educated you are, how well things are for you in your life. Worship is not about acquiring riches and becoming comfortable. It is because God created us in his image. And so Jesus speaks to Laodicea and he speaks to us, maybe in our state of spiritual complacency, and he says, let me into your life. Let me gain control. There is a song that I like so much, which has a line that says, hold to God's unchanging hand and build your, thing, your hopes on things that are eternal. Hebrews 2 verse 10 tells us that Jesus is the captain of our salvation. Is Jesus at the controls in the cockpit of your life? Or he is locked outside? Meanwhile, you, are, you allow someone else to be flying your life toward the rocks. I grew up listening to the voice of Jim Reeves singing this beautiful song, I would rather have Jesus than anything that this world affords today. May that be your prayer. May that be my prayer. Let us have Captain Jesus at the controls in our lives. Let him not be a locked out captain. May God bless you. Let us close our eyes in a moment of prayer. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, may glory and honor come to you, for only you are worthy to be praised. We worship you and we thank you because you care so deeply about our destiny. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, many are times when we are fooled by the successes, by the comforts of life, and we forget who and what you mean in our lives, who you are and what it is that you mean. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we pray and we acknowledge you as the captain of our salvation. May you take control, and lest the devil will fly us into the rocks. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, even for the families of those who lost their loved ones, in that dreadful plane crash. May you comfort them. May you heal them. May you be with, there for them. We pray and we acknowledge you for this message and for all you have done for us. In the name of Jesus, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>